Well, good morning. Good to see each of you here. Sharon, if you need me to hold her, I'll be glad to hold her, okay? If you have your Bibles, if you would open them to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 14. Thanks for joining us as we worship our great God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, excited to open the word with you as we look at just a few verses here at the end of Acts chapter 14. If you are chilly, if you move out into the sun, it's getting warm. So if you get cold, you need to move out, you can do that. So feel free to do that. Acts chapter 14, and we're going to, actually we'll start in verse 24, and then we're going to read through the end of the chapter, verse 28. So Acts chapter 14, verses 24 through 28. Let's read together. You follow along there. It says, then they passed through Poseidon and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, um, they went down to Atalia. And from there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commanded, commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples." That is not my stomach growling, that's just the wind. So if you hear the wind, um, just, it's all good. I've had enough to eat this morning, Pop-Tart and some coffee and a banana, so we're good. Um, we, we come to this passage where we see that uh, Paul and Barnabas are heading home, okay? They're heading back to Antioch, back to the church that had sent them. And so in their travels, it shows us, we looked a little bit about this, how they had set up some, uh, some leadership in the verses in, in front of that, verse 23, they appointed elders. We looked at that last week. Um, they, they hit a new area in Perga. Verse 25, it says, when they had spoken the word in Perga. Um, so they, they brought the word uh, there to a new place and preached the word. And then they went home to Antioch, to the church that had sent them. Um, it's nice to go back home, isn't it? I think of that whenever we go on vacation. It's nice to go away, get away from it all. But about five or six or seven days in, maybe sometimes sooner, sometimes later, um, you look and you say, man, I'm looking forward to going home. And on any of our missions trips that we've taken over the years, it's, it's nice. We love it. We see God using, using us and, and God working. But there is no place like home. And uh, as one movie says, but we see Paul and Barnabas as they've gone about their travels and as they've endured um, some great things, some miracles, some, some things that God had done in their midst of healing and, 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 and great revivals, people coming and trusting Jesus as their savior, but also some difficulties of where there was some, um, some great persecution to the point where even Paul was, was stoned and, and left for dead. And so they're at this point where they're heading back and they, and, and, and Dr. Luke gives us um, a record that as they go back to Antioch, what takes place? And we want to digest this a little bit. So they go back home, uh, back to their sending church. And, uh, and let's look at verse 26. It says, from there, they sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. So when we look at this, the grace of God was this. And ultimately, I think this passage goes back to chapter 13 and verse 2. So if you have your Bibles or your electronic device, flip back to Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. So Acts chapter 13, verse 2 says this, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So this is the church in Antioch. They're, they're worshiping, they're, they're praying, they're fasting. And the spirit says, I want you to set these two men aside for the work that I have for them. What's interesting is if you look at Paul and Barnabas, uh, what is that work? We, Dr. Luke doesn't give us the, 
the clarity of defining what that work was. Ultimately, we know that work to be the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles specifically, but they would go and preach the gospel to the Jews as well because they were going into the synagogue. We see that pattern over and over again where they first would go into the synagogue and use that as the, the means, the way of preaching the gospel. And then they would use the marketplace as, as another means. And so this work that the Spirit had called to them had called them to was a manifestation of the grace of God. And so as Dr. Luke records here, um, they, they had been commended to the, grace, uh, to the grace of God for the work that they had been fulfilled. The grace of God there is ultimately the initiative of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's work in, in the church in Antioch, but also in Paul and Barnabas' life. That God was going to use them. It's the grace of God. In them and through them. It's the spirit of God that works in you. It's the spirit of God and his grace that the spirit would fill you and be you. And we're going to look in a couple of verses how Paul mentions the calling uh, and, and how the spirit of God is manifested in that as we live out our lives. So the grace of God is the initiative of the spirit. And, and then we see here back in chapter 15 that uh, for the work that they had fulfilled... Again, chapter 13, verse 2 says, uh, the Spirit says, the work which I have called them. Now they come to the end of that, and they get to give a report for the work that the Spirit gave them. They're giving a report for that. And so they, they say, this is the work that has been fulfilled, which is wonderful. And that word, uh, that next word in the verse 27, when they have arrived... They gathered the church together and they declared, that word declared, reported. It means to bring back information. So here they were out and, and doing the work of the Lord and they were going to bring back. And so they gathered the whole church in Antioch together. They brought them together and they started declaring what God had done. And so they proclaimed the gospel in Cyprus, in southern Galatia, and then Pamphylia. And so as they shared these stories with the church in Antioch, um, Dr. Luke says that they declared all that God had done. And so this was uh, probably in more details than what Dr. Luke has recorded for us. They share detail after detail of how God was working, how the spirit of God that called them to this work had used them to do the work and how God was working. And so all of that, all those things God had done. Notice what, what Luke says there in verse 27. It says, when they arrived and gathered the church together, they, they declared, A, all that God had done with them. It wasn't them doing the work. It was God doing it through them. That's a good reminder for us today. If we go about our work, uh, we probably won't be doing what God wants. We need to let God work in us and through us. It's God working through us. And so they're reporting what God had done through them. This was God's doing and not theirs. And then the next part of that, God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And so this word opened the door, it, it reminded me of an opportunity that I had this week. And maybe you've had an opportunity this week that God opened the doors for you uh, to display the spirit of God. Let me encourage you to look for open doors. There's always open doors. Sometimes God closes them, but, but there's a lot of open doors that I think sometimes we miss in our lives. Open doors to show the grace of God, to speak a kind word, to even be able to go and to share the full gospel with somebody because their heart and their, their mind is ripe and ready to hear it. Here this week, um, I was out just doing some odd things, mainly because uh, Jen had found a bunch of nails on Thursday from the roof. Uh, we, the Lord blessed us and we were able to have a new roof because of hail damage. So last Saturday, um, the men came and they spent all day and they, they did a marvelous job. What we found though, is, as those trailers were being taken away, um, that there were some nails that were left behind. And so um, she found a few and then I went out and as I was walking uh, Friday morning, I found a few more which then left me on an endeavor to say, you know what, where there's a few, there's probably more. And so I started on the far end and I just walked Friday morning. It was perfect. The sun was shining at a perfect angle. So you could see every little rock or pebble or nail that was laying there. And so 
Hopefully you don't have any nails in your tires today. Um, but I started just walking back and forth. And, and as I walked through the parking lot, um, uh, the gentleman who mows for the, the, the baseball, uh, we, we have a great relationship with Wobble, West Akron Baseball League. And, uh, and, and the gentleman who was mowing for them um, just kind of came up as I was walking back and forth. He said, do you need me to move my, my truck and my, my trailer? And I said, no, everything's okay. He said, did you lose something? Uh, I said, yeah, I lost a lot of things, but I'm not sure I'll find them here. Um, but I told him about the nails. I showed him the nails and he said, oh. And so that struck up a conversation as we just talked a little bit. Um, through our conversation, I presented just something, not the gospel, but I mentioned something about the word grace. And in using that word grace, it, it set him on, on an exploration where then we talked for a little bit and then he emailed me later on and he told me about that was the first hour that he had of five hours of mowing different fields. And as he was going from field to field, um, he, he kept thinking about grace and what grace was. And it reminded him of, uh, of an old movie that he had watched and he was sharing a little bit about that. Um, that was an open door to be able to just share a little bit about God's a wonderful and amazing grace and how it's hard to make sense. And how do you define something like that? And for him, it was really difficult. He didn't know how to define it at that point. And so God's opened that door to be able to have a conversation with somebody. And I, I wonder what doors are, are, are God, is God trying to open for you? What, what doors is he trying to use you to do his work? God clearly opened the doors for Paul and Barnabas. And we've read about a lot of it. How, how God opened the doors for, for people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the interesting thing is you don't know how people are going to respond. Sometimes we think in our minds how somebody's going to respond. If I say this, then maybe they'll get upset. Or maybe I shouldn't say this because we come to our own conclusions. I, I think we need to trust more on the spirit of God to open those doors and less upon ourselves. And so as Paul and Barnabas are giving an account, they see that how God has opened the door clearly for the Gentiles to come and to trust Jesus as their savior. As, uh, as, he fin as Dr. Luke writes at the end of this, how they remained there no little time with the disciples. Ultimately, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity for Paul and Barnabas then to spend a significant time with the church there in Antioch. That's what that's saying, that they participated in the life of a church. See, Paul and Barnabas weren't so busy doing the work of God that they weren't then part of a church. They were sent by the church in Antioch to do the mission that God had called them to do, to do the work that God had called them specifically to do. And then as they came back and reported that work, that work that Dr. Luke says was fulfilled Hey, they completed the work, they came back, and then they were, they, were, they were a part of, they were participating with the church there in Antioch. It's a beautiful picture for us. They weren't just doing their own thing. They were a part of a church. And that should encourage us. No matter what God calling, what his calling is in our life, there's always a draw back to the local church. That we are called to be a part of that. Now, there may be times and season as God calls us out that we are part of the church and the extension of that church reaching other people for Jesus Christ. But the coming back and continually participating in the church is a critical aspect of, that we see in the book of Acts. So here's my question to you. What work has God called you to do? What work has God called you to do? Uh, I want to read a couple passages because uh, Paul talks about this in, in several of his letters. And in Romans chapter 8, and you can turn there if you want with me, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. It's probably a passage that you're familiar with, um, but if you're not, here it is. Act, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30 says, For those whom he foreknew, he, all, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among brothers, many brothers. 
And those whom he predestined, that's you and I, those who have trusted Jesus as our Savior, he also called. It's that same word that we see that Paul and Barnabas were called by the Spirit of God. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, take your Bibles and keep flipping over to the book of Philippians. So God has called us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So here's the call, the upward call. There's something more glorious than what we do every single day. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call. Now, flip over to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3. Verse number 1. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Those of you who share in a heavenly calling. We've been called to a heavenly calling. To something beyond just here and now. It's not about just going to work. It's not just about going to school. It's not about just coming to church. It's not about just being a father or a mother or a daughter or a son. It's much more than that. We as Christ followers have a work that God wants to do. And he does that in us and through us. And that happens as the spirit of God works in us and works through us. It's not my work. It's not your work. It's God's work that he's called us to in order to work through us. It's the spirit of God. And as we allow the spirit of God to lead us and to guide us, we get to see what that calling is. And then we get to see the opening of the doors that he wants to use us in. So what work has God called you to? What hopes, tastes, what desires do you have that God's put inside of you that he wants to use you through? The work that God has called me to is to my wife, to be a husband, to my children, to be their dad, to my family, to be a son and brother, to the church, to lead our staff and our leaders, to shepherd you, to care for you. The work that God has given me as a cross-country coach, as a team, and as to the parents at Skyview, to be able to serve on the board, to be a light and testimony to those who are campers, but also to the staff to encourage them and help them. Those are just little pieces of my life that God has called me to. What would you write down? What could you write down and say, this is what God's work and how he is calling me and desiring to use me today? What is his work for you? You need to write it down. You need to see it. What does it look like? How are you allowing the spirit of God to use you as he opens doors? And then use those doors. You may not be real confident in sharing your faith. The more you do it, the more confident you become. The more you rely upon the spirit, the more confident you become. You say, well, pastor, I don't know what to say. You're a good speaker, but I can't talk like you. You don't have to talk like me. Do the work that God has called you to. Do what God's called you to do. And to share the light of Jesus Christ with those around you. It's to your family. It's to your friends, your neighbors. It's to the, all those that God has placed in your life. Be faithful in the work that God has called you to do. So I challenge you as you go throughout your day today and throughout this week. To write down a list. What is the work 
What's the work that God's called you to? Maybe you'll be surprised as the spirit leads you what doors that he may open for you. And then the, the wonderful thing, we, let's come back and, and let's gather as the church, just as Paul and Barnabas did, and let's share with one another what God is doing in your life and in your heart, how God is using you for his work. And so that we may be encouraged and know that God still sits on the throne. God is still working. He is alive and his word is alive and active and it's penetrating and working in our own hearts and we're using it to, he, we're allowing him to use it in other people's lives as well. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you in this place and in this way. Lord, it's unique as we look out and Lord, I think about the hundreds of people that have already passed looking and examining and seeing what we're doing. Um, to a lot of the world, they look at what we do and they think it's strange. Why would, why would you sing? Why, why would you lift your voices to a God that you, you can't even see? How do, how do you know he's real is their, their question. Lord, we have the great privilege of having your word and we've looked at it and we examine it to, to challenge us, to convict us, to motivate us, to lead us. That by your spirit that lives inside of each one of us, that we allow you to guide us and to direct us. Thank you, Lord, that Christ lives in us and each one who has acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So that as we live each day, knowing that Christ is in us, we get to go about to the work that you've called us to do. No one's, one's work is more important than the other work. Lord, you've called us each to do your work. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in doing that. May we be sensitive to your spirit's leading and to your guiding in our lives. And as you lead and guide in us, may we be obedient. Lord, we believe that obedience is right away and all the way and that we do it with a happy heart. So may that be true in our lives as we seek to do your will and to do your work. And then as we gather as the church, we gather back up and we share and give testimony of how you're opening doors, how we see you working. Lord, may that stir us to further be obedient. May that cause great praise to your name, knowing that it's your work. It's what you're doing. It's not us. So, Lord, we're thankful for this time. We thank you for your message. Lord, may you help us to live it out this week and the days ahead. Lord, may you bless each one that's here as they, as they go and live in a world that desires, um, uh, that, that can be led, led astray and let it lead us astray. Lord, may we not be led astray. May we not give in to the world's demands. Lord, may we not become discouraged or overwhelmed. May we trust in Jesus. Lord, we love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah. Amen.